We are gonna ride out, and we are gonna find some food. Everybody, we're safe now. There ain't nobody following us through a storm like this one. And by the time they get here, well, we're gonna be, we're gonna be long gone. We've been through worse than this before. Mr. Pierce, Miss Grimshaw, I need you to turn this place into a camp. We may be here for a few days. Now, all of you, all of you, get yourselves warm. Stay strong. Stay with me. We ain't done yet. Very minor, I suppose, but one of the first things that strikes me here, not knowing anything about these characters, is obviously we just went through something that was incredibly distressing. Everybody in there is cold. They seem to be tired. They seem to have no direction. They're confused. And one of the things I admire about the way that Dutch handled that speech was that he gave that speech almost entirely in the affirmative. So he gave them very clear, concise directions that are very easy to understand. Get yourself warm. Stay with me. He was reassuring, but he was also real, I guess, to the extent that we understand that he was real about that. And I actually really admire that. That's a really good way to handle a giant group of people who are under duress who might be confused about what's going on. From a leadership standpoint and kind of moving group dynamics, I really like that as a starter. A good first impression. I know you hate him, Dutch. He's here for us. I doubt that. No, nope, you're just doubting me. I would never doubt you, Dutch. You, you always said revenge is a luxury we can't afford. This is the right call, Arthur. And this is about more than revenge for business long ago. That line from Dutch, you don't doubt that, you doubt me? What a line. Because it's true. If this information gets delivered by somebody else, perhaps somebody who Arthur either doesn't have history with or somebody who... To that point, Arthur has learned he can trust with the types of convictions he has, then maybe he's more willing to go along. What this tells me is that is two things. One, Arthur probably does have some level of reserve for whatever Dutch has to say, in part because Dutch has probably has a history of overpromising and underdelivering, or saying that something is the case and then it doesn't end up being that. And then Dutch has had that happen enough times in his life with Arthur around that he has the insight to know that Arthur is doubting him, not necessarily what it is that he's presenting. And I think that's really cool from a dynamic perspective, like a relationship dynamic, that Dutch has enough insight into the history he has with Arthur to be able to call that out. Like, super cool. I don't know, I just, that was a really neat line. I liked that a lot. You're Arthur, right? My oh! No concern of yours. I'm hungry. I don't give a damn. Look, you, you seem like a decent fella behind it all. Then you ain't a good judge of character. Yeah, well, we'll leave it there and there. Now, I find this interesting that he says, you know, behind all that, I sense that there's maybe a decent man. And Arthur's like, nah, you're wrong. Here's kind of how projection works and self-schemas work. So if Arthur really does believe that he is a bad person and has created that internal schema for himself, he is going to act in accordance with that. And any time that somebody suggests otherwise, that is actually going to create some level of internal aversive arousal for him. And he is likely going to double down on the fact that he is a bad person. He's going to project that into the world. He's going to assume that other folks see him as a bad man. And anybody who doesn't, anybody who, like Kieran here, indicate that they think that he's good, if they appeal to his humanity, he's going to argue with them because it misaligns with his own internal story. And this is important for all of us to understand because if you go out into the world projecting that you're a bad person, that you're incompetent, that you're a burden, you're going to interact with people as if that is the case, even when they flex their own autonomy and tell you what their perception of you is. And so then you put people into a position where they have to defend their positive opinion of you. And if you do enough of that, you become burdensome by not internalizing or at the very least allowing other folks to have their own opinion of you. And so Arthur keeps acting on this idea that he's a bad man and he doesn't have to be. It's a choice that he continues to perpetuate that narrative for himself. And he needs to be careful because if he's in a position where he could maybe do the right thing versus do the wrong thing, 
he might choose the wrong thing because he thinks that aligns with who he is instead of actually taking a more 30,000 foot level of it. Here you go. You're a gentleman, sir. A gentleman. No, not really. I was just trying to impress the women. <laughs> well, anyway, thank you. I want to know where Arthur learned to be so steadfast in his self-loathing. This guy thanks him, and Arthur can't even bring himself to say to the guy, you're welcome, I'm happy to help. He says, ah, nah, it's not about you. I was just trying to impress the women. I'm a piece of shit. That narrative at some point in Arthur's life must have served a very specific function. That or it was drilled into him in his formative years. People don't come out into the world automatically thinking they're bad people. People come out into the world and they're told that. And so what it makes me wonder is that at some point, if Arthur was you know, doing good deeds, so to speak, and was maybe punished for it and learned that doing good is not actually useful. Doing good gets you screwed. Being bad allows you to preserve your autonomy. He may very well have built a narrative that I'm a piece of shit. And he just sticks to that. And I think, again, he has to. We have to take the group dynamic into account. The people he rolls with have this idea that they're outlaw shitty people. And if Arthur starts to question that, he probably has to question the group, which is to also question his survival. And people get into this bind all the time, where if the groups that you align with, if you start to dissent from them, even if it means finding your own self-worth, you're going to experience tension and dissonance in that. That's how cults can hold people in, especially if they do bad stuff. I'm not calling our group a cult per se, but... It's striking to me how often Arthur adheres to his inner schema of himself and his inner dialogue that he is a bad person. I mean, he is just throwing that out in the world completely. Even when this guy, he we just helped this guy out. He says, hey, nice, thank you. And Arthur comes up with a completely other story to maintain the sense that he sucks. Come on, what? Arthur, enough showing off. Huh. Oh, let's go. There you go. We just did a good deed and Uncle says, quit your showing off. That is a perfect example. Arthur goes and does something good, and Uncle immediately punishes him with the way that he interfaces with him when he gets back on the cart. This couldn't be because Arthur has it in his heart to help folks. This must be because Arthur's showing off. He's got an ulterior motive. So he's effectively punished Arthur for doing that. We come back to our group, and they give me shit for it. This is what I mean. This stuff gets reinforced. It's amazing how quickly we just saw that happen. That is wild. I asked my boys here if they would help their pa build a, a new house. Thought I'd teach them a few things, you know. Couldn't hammer a nail to save their lives. Ain't that right, Curtis? Whatever you say, pa. Look out! Oh, shit! What in holy hell are you doing, boy? Get that back up again right now. I, I'm going to be 100 years old by the time we get this done. No, 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 no. Get away from it. Get away from it before you mess it up even worse than it is. Well, he don't like the way we're doing it. He should do it himself. Damn straight. Let's just enjoy the silence for a few minutes before he starts griping at us again. If you are in a position where you ask for help on a certain skill that you are more skilled at, than the people that are helping you. A general rule of thumb is that you want to assist them in learning that skill so that they can be effective at it. You want to reinforce aspects of that performance that are desirable through appreciation and acknowledgement and encouragement and, and saying like, that's exactly what we want, good job. Shaming people, yelling at them, expecting them to do something that's beyond their ability just because you know how to do it that way and assuming that everybody else is as competent in a thing as you are is not the way. So the way that this father interacts with his sons on this is not going to be good for them creating this house. Sit down with them and teach them the skill. Be there with them. Non-judgmental repetition. Reinforce the fact that you're glad they're here. These are all the ways that you support people in getting things done. And so this guy just being like, y'all are pieces of shit idiots that don't know how to do this and will never get this built that does not motivate people and you're hearing that in this conversation that these sons are having like god damn why does he always yell at us like that they don't even know why he yells at them you have to be very clear when you're giving directions and with what your expectations are and if people aren't meeting them help them that's what you do in a position of leadership also you don't look more competent by shaming people for their lack of competence i'll say that again for people in the back you do not look more competent by shaming people who are not competent. It just makes you look like an asshole. 
Let's say you yourself or someone else with mental health education suddenly appeared in this time period and all the therapeutic methods, etc. Do you think people would accept the help or reject it? I think people would be skeptical of the fact that I am educated and that I'm coming to talk to them about that stuff. I think people would say to me, I don't need that shit. Again, you because I would have to know the way that the idea or concept of therapy or help has been represented to them, and I'm guessing not well. They probably think I'm some sort of snake oil salesman, to be completely honest. Like, I, I don't think you can take modern day stuff and throw it back in the past and assume that people in the past are going to understand that stuff as well as we do. Therapy as a concept and where it is today is something that has evolved over time. It's not something that just spontaneously arrived. So if I go there and I spontaneously arrive as a therapist, that's going to be incredibly jarring and they don't have the historical context through which therapy is now understood to be able to see that I could actually be beneficial to them. But again, therapy is also in a lot of ways a luxury. They're just not going to draw to it the way that we would expect people to now. A psychologist now is threatening. I mean, we're seeing people who are educated in general are threatening. I start going around saying, hey, I can help, but I got to work with your mind. It's going to open people up to stuff that like this world doesn't really support and have enough safety for them to be able to do. Anything that I crack open as a therapist is going to be an antithesis to survival. And they can't afford that in this time period. We can afford that now. If we talk about a person's trauma now and they become really disorganized by it and distressed by it, in general, they're going to be able to go home and they'll have, you know, they're probably in a generally safe environment with water and shelter and food and whatnot. Here, that ain't necessarily the case. So I am way less helpful during this time period than I would be now. I do know Colm killed Dutch's sweetheart. And that's the man you chose to ride with. A woman killer. Well, it was after he killed his brother. And the way I understood it, the... Making excuses for the man and his crimes. What kind of trap you leading us into, boy? I ain't. I'm trying to help honest. Schema right there. Again, Marston's not giving this guy a chance. Now, do we get a little bit of lore here? That's, that's useful, yeah. Friends, this is why context is so important. This is why being curious and asking people about their decision trees gets you way farther than making assumptions about them and then operating off of those assumptions. Marston just keeps filing everything this guy says into a way that he can't get out of. Oh, so you you went and followed a woman killer as if Dutch has never killed a woman in his life, as if our group hasn't killed women in his life. Somehow that's bad because he's in the outside group, but it's fine if we do it. Because when we do it, we understand the reason why we did it. Instead, we think that whatever reason they had to do that must have been a bad reason, and thus we judge the shit out of it, and we don't give him the benefit of curiosity. I do think that Marston's defensiveness here is in protection of Dutch. I think if we go too far down the line of empathizing with the enemy, now all of a sudden, what does that mean for this guy we follow? What does that mean for me? Right? There is self-interest at stake in being defensive here. So I understand it. I just think from like an interactional standpoint, this is not the way that you want to approach interactions. This isn't how you get good information. This isn't how you get nice integration. This isn't how you have civility. This is how you further polarize yourself into problematic stuff where you start acting in ways that you really don't need to that's at the expense of you individually and the group you're part of. You know, you all ain't that different from the O'Driscolls. Careful, dude. What did you just say? I've been watching you all these weeks and, uh... You've been tied to a tree. You don't know nothing about this game. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd say you don't know much about the O'Driscolls. But maybe I know more about you than you know about them. And I know all about them, so... <laughs> Tell us then, how are we like those mongrel dogs? You're outlawed like them. You're out to survive like them. You live rough. You live hard. Fighting the law. Nature. You're out for yourselves. See? This is why you're an O'Driscoll, O'Driscoll. You're out to survive. We're out to live. Free. Colm's a sneak thief and a killer. Dutch is... Dutch is more like a teacher. From where I've been, you just look the same as all. Then you looked, but you ain't seen. John, shut that boy up. Shut that boy up. He's making too much sense. We're gonna hate ourselves if we realize that we're basically the same. This guy's the most informed guy in the entire group. And we see intellect and observation as threat. And something that I think is really a sign of Kieran's intellect here is Kieran is engaging in what we call process commentary in the, in the therapy world. He has noticed 
that a lot of the dynamics, the interactional mechanisms, all of these things within the group, how things are expressed, why they're expressed that way, that's all process. Content is where we live and what we've done to survive and all that stuff, but he's noticing the underlying dynamics of these groups and he's drawing parallels, which I think all of us have intuitively done. But drawing that parallel at the process level, what you're gonna see is content defense, which is what John just did, which is John says, you know, yeah, well, well Dutch is more like a teacher. He's trying to justify a same process and keep it differentiated through content, but that actually isn't as effective as the process commentary that Kieran's engaging in. So it's pretty remarkable that Kieran has that insight and his observation and curiosity about it is the way that he got there. And again, that becomes very threatening because if we connect with that, now all of a sudden we're fighting with ourselves and that's not really great for survival in the group. And so now we're gonna we're gonna polarize into our deferring content interests. Again, I mean, this is something you see folks do all the time. Reading betrayal in your world, Miss Grimshaw? It's not reading this. Idleness. Idleness is betrayal because it means I work so you don't have to. That's not right, is it? I guess not, miss. You're right not, missy. On. That exchange brings up a very important point, though, which is the interplay between over and under functioners. And we look at this through a behavioral reinforcement standpoint. When you have a person who under functions in a group relative to what their expectations are, it invites other people who are have a propensity for over functioning to fill that space, particularly if the task that the person is under functioning on is really important. And what happens is if you're not careful, they start to reinforce each other. So the more I under function, the more others over function in my stead, which then gets all the tasks completed that I need to have done. Thus, I can continue to under function because I'm learning that other folks will fill in for me. So if you're a person that over functions on behalf of under functioners, but doesn't say anything and instead sits and resents people for it, you're not actually doing yourself any favor and you're actually reinforcing that person's under functioning in the same way that an under functioner is reinforcing over functioning by remaining under functional. So it's on the over functioner in this instance to set a boundary with the under functioner and clearly state the expectation which is what miss grimshaw just did and i think that's really cool like she just pointed it out in a very like direct way but you have to intercept that and one of the ways that you intercept an over under functioner dynamic is for the over functioner to set that boundary and then back off and allow the under functioner to step up. And then what the under functioner learns is that as they step in and do stuff, then the over functioners back off and then you can, you can send it in a different direction. But that type of feedback loop can be pretty tough to get out of at times. Sadie, 84 cents, Charles, three bucks, John, 825, Bill, 326, Arthur, 25, Arthur, 25, Arthur, 15, 15. I don't know about all of you, but I want my leader on this page. Where the hell is Dutch? I could totally understand if nobody else was in here. I don't care about the others. The others are doing their best. The others are not the leader of the camp. The others are just trying to make ends meet. Dutch ain't on this list. Dutch walks around wearing these fine gold rings with the 10 gallon hat and the trench coat and the pinstripe three piece suit. Yet my man ain't donating shit to the public kitty which to me is poor leadership. I want to see my man put the first dollar in the box. I want to see him regularly contribute. I want to see in tangible terms, I am taking care of my people. And I don't see that in this ledger. I'm glad there are names on this ledger because this helps us know who to hold accountable. And who we need to hold accountable on this ledger are the leaders, not the followers. Even uh, Sadie bringing in 84 cents. She's doing her best. I see nothing from Dutch. Can't we be friends? Sure. I'm so happy. I ain't had a friend in a long time. Long, long time. My last friend died. Weren't my fault. They said it was, but they was wrong. It's fun being with you, mister. Can I hold you a second, mister? Can I? 
We just met, brother. If you need a hug, I'll oblige. Okay, just quickly. That felt good. It's nice to be held sometimes. Well, we used to hold each other in the war. You got sad eyes, mister. Like you've seen sad things. Remember with kindness. <sighs> I don't know, man. That, like, actually, like, kind of hits me. Like, I... that dude's seen some, adver some real adversity, and I'm guessing that uh, the way he was affected by the war is absolutely probably affecting him now. I'm not going to call it PTSD, obviously, because I haven't assessed it, but, like, there's no doubt that that guy's seen some trauma. I mean, look, he's got his arm. His arm is off. And if that guy's experiencing some significant adversity and doesn't have the coping skills post-war to be able to find employment or to engage in meaningful relationships, then I give this guy all the credit in the world for asking directly for what he needed there. We undervalue or underestimate, I should say, the power of human interaction. And that's what that guy needed there. And we provided it to him. And we didn't do it for our own self-edification. We did it to help that guy out. That guy might have a great day or two now. Hell, maybe even a week. Knowing that I took the time to acknowledge him. Like, that, that's a really tender moment there. That was really cool. And it goes against everything Arthur always says about himself. That he's some bad dude. I just, I really like that. I, I don't, you know, don't underestimate the power of human connection. You know, if your initial aversion to that guy was like, oh, God, here's another asshole that's going to ask me for money, you ought to, like, check your values there. That guy just needed somebody to talk to. And even if I didn't give him money, right? Like, if he had asked for money, maybe I would have done that. Maybe I wouldn't have. But I still gave that guy a bit of connection and humanity. Oh, my God! Come on! Oh, shit! Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, oh, no, you don't. <sighs> what the hell is wrong with you? What the hell is wrong with you? Throwing me off a bridge like there that. There was a goddamn train, you crazy bastard. <sighs> Have I been bad again, Mr. Morgan? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I wish I was different. <laughs> Let's get you home. I wish I was different. It's such a convenient way of trying to justify the actions that you take. When you view your behaviors as inevitable, as out of your control, as linked to your personality, no good. That is a convenient excuse to enable yourself to continue doing what you're doing. Your behaviors are a choice. He chose to get drunk chose to run out onto the railroad track he chose to do all this stuff when he says i wish i was different he's using that as an excuse for these behaviors instead of looking at his own accountability and all of us could do well to learn from that when people box themselves in and say like i had to do it this is how i am what they're doing is they're avoiding the accountability they have for the actions they take the reason we look at behavior as a choice is because it empowers people to make better choices. If this guy wants to be different, he needs to choose different behavior. And that's something that's absolutely within his power to do. It's not an inevitability that he acts this way. It's a choice. So how are things with you and John? Fine. Ain't it about time you let it go now? It was a year, I'll say. He ditched us for a goddamn year. I've spoken to him many times. He knows he did wrong. That's triangulation right there, chat. What Jose is doing right there is self-triangulating. He is pushing himself into our business. What goes on between me and John is 
between me and John. If you are affected by it in a certain way and it affects my relationship to you, Hosea, then let's talk about that. But I don't need you button into how I handle my business with John Marston. This is a great example of what not to do, friends. Hosea has no right to do this. He can certainly do it, but it doesn't look well on him. Self-triangulation is no bueno. Let me deal with what's going on with John. It's okay to ask how I'm doing with it, but don't tell me what to do. Tell me how it affects you. If it makes it awkward for you to engage with me because of what's going on, then let's figure that out. Let's problem solve that. But don't be telling me what to do with John. Avoid this. Don't get yourself stuck in other people's business like this, chat. Let's see if Dutch gives us any crap about disappearing like that. I don't need another. We gotta be out there making money speech. We were just out scoping a lead. He doesn't need to know it was a big furry one. That is super interesting. I'm telling you, man, the amount of stuff that comes out in just tiny little linguistic things. That reframe there says so much about Dutch and the group. Because we're talking about Arthur and Hosea here, guys that have been with this gang for a long time. And when presented with the frame of this is something that we're doing for our own self edification, they immediately think, oh, Dutch ain't gonna go for that. And then as soon as Hosea says, no, 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 we'll reframe it. We'll, we'll say that we were chasing a lead. That's in the spirit of the group, the betterment of whatever it is. That's what Dutch will be okay with. It shows us that dissent, self-indulgence, is indeed perceived as the antithesis of the group and its survival and how you belong in it. So autonomy is not good for the group. Chasing leads for the benefit of the group is. Dutch is expecting that people basically lose themselves into the group, yet Dutch differentiates himself from the group as the leader. You gotta be real careful of shit like that. I, as the leader, get to be separate of the group, but you all are part of the group to be absorbed, not have any autonomy within. I, I don't like it. I don't like it. And it comes out in that tiny little exchange. I mean, you gotta watch for that stuff. What are the frames that make things we do palatable for other people? I think a lot of people resonate with Arthur's self-loathing. Is there any advice you can give to someone who wants to break out of that and be kinder to themselves? Oh, absolutely. So Arthur's self-loathing is absolutely something that people can connect with. And I think all of us have to be mindful that self-loathing and those narratives we tell ourselves are a choice. It is not a reflection of truth. And the reason I say this is because so many people believe that their self-loathing is something that they are just subject to. It's something that just happens to them, that they just have it. They can't divorce themselves from it. It's not true. More often than not, self-loathing narratives have been borrowed from others. They are created by others and in reference to others. And so the most important question that a person with self-loathing that wants to get out of it can ask themselves is, if I had higher self-esteem, if I had self-love, what would I say to myself instead? Probably things like, I'm worthy, I'm important, I matter, I have something to offer. Well, those are things that you don't just automatically believe one day. Those are things that you have to actually intentionally inject into your internal narrative. Those are things that you have to intentionally say. You aren't probably gonna believe them at first, but until you start conversing with yourself in a more kind, patient, and loving way, you can't expect other people to do that for you. You derive self-worth from what other people tell you about you. That's not great. Also, if you engage in self-loathing, you are gonna fight against anybody who says, you know, you actually, you matter to me a lot and I really like you. So it starts with you. You have to you have to rewrite that narrative that's been ingrained over a long period of time. And that takes more intention and it takes more time than people generally like. Because the thing is, is if you build up a pattern of self-loathing, you, you really solidify that narrative and it becomes like who you are and you see who you are as a stagnant thing that can't change, you've boxed yourself in. And I say that it's a choice for people to tell themselves that kind of thing and engage in that self-loathing because it empowers them to make that change if it's something that you actually want to make. Otherwise, it will be continued to be perpetuated. Sean will make your life hell when he finds out you're an O'Driscoll. Oh, great. Just be grateful you're alive. Do you think Arthur did that intentionally or could it have been a habit to unassociate anyone who didn't start off with them or came from another group? I think if Arthur cared enough about Kieran, he would make the effort or he would have apologized. I think Kieran not fighting against that tells me that Arthur's not the only person who's doing that. Kieran doesn't feel powerful enough to correct him. Kieran is still afraid that it puts him in danger to correct him. Very similar to how folks who use um, you know, different pronouns than a person might use 
might be afraid to out themselves or put themselves in danger by correcting that person for their pronouns. Like we see power dynamics in these little exchanges and Kieran doesn't correct him. There's still a subconscious bias with Arthur in him calling him O'Driscoll there. It means that Arthur hasn't done the work internally yet to fully conceptualize Kieran as one of them. And I don't know if it's because he feels pressure from the group to do that or if that's how he himself, fe he himself feels. But as we discussed earlier, it's hard to tell what the group versus what Arthur believes is. We too often give people in the dominant group the benefit of the doubt when they microaggress. It's important to call out microaggressions when we see it. We generally don't assume or give the benefit of the doubt to people in marginalized groups, but we almost always do to folks in dominant groups. Arthur's part of the dominant subset of this group. Arthur has the ability to call him O'Driscoll with no real repercussion. If Arthur calls him O'Driscoll and Uncle and Dutch and John Marston or anybody within earshot comes over and says, yo, he's one of us now, stop calling him that. That's how you hold people accountable for microaggressions. It's not, it's not the marginalized person holding the dominant person accountable for it. It's fellow dominant people holding dominant people accountable to it. I think it's easy for us to look at it and go, yeah, no, Arthur just made a mistake. But he microaggressed. He absolutely microaggressed. Even if it wasn't intentional, it's still pretty shitty. And so Arthur needs to have that bias brought to his consciousness. He needs to understand the impact that that has. He just othered somebody within the group. I'm sure there is at least a person or two who are watching me talk about this right now, who are rolling their eyes, and going, oh my God, Dr. Mick, are we really going to micromanage all of these? We are literally talking about this guy's identity. We're talking about who he is. He could run away from our group at any point in time, and he has not done that. Language is super important. It holds true for even relating to now, you know, when we microaggress. It's easy for people in dominant groups to roll their eyes at, like, oh my God, is everything a microaggression? I mean, there's lots of them, but we don't have to like it make a huge deal out of it. You just got to do better. You just have to recognize when you've microaggressed and be like, okay, all right, that was pretty shitty. That person didn't appreciate that. You know, stopping a train, pain in the ass. Sure. But what if we could force a train to stop? <laughs> well, of course. We get a wagon full of something flammable, oil, put it on the tracks. They see it. They know they either have to stop or die. Ain't no train driver wants to be cooked alive. That is kind of brilliant uh, for you. <laughs> that is a real idea. I think that's the first time you ever had one of them. Shut up. You might be the first bastard to ever have half his brains eaten by a wolf and end up more intelligent. So we're doing it? Yeah, we're gonna need ammunition, guns, the real frightening, and... To bring our conversation back to conditioning, the way you respond to folks when they engage with you is so important. So John Marston has a really good idea about how to stop this train that Arthur appreciates as a good idea. Now we could argue that that's a desirable behavior. We are trying to get money. We are trying to find our way to freedom as it relates to this gang. John Marston coming up with that idea is fabulous. The way that Arthur responds to him is terrible. That is how you interactionally punish a desirable behavior. If you get threatened by smart ideas, which I don't know that Arthur's threatened by this, but like if you get threatened by smart ideas and you punish people for having them, all you're doing is either extinguishing their desire to speak up and give you good ideas, or those people are going to push you away. Like John Marston is probably really proud of the fact that he came up with this, and instead Arthur gives him shit for it. And yeah, we could say, well, they're just, <laughs> you know, they're just, they're bros, they blah, blah, blah. But, but you know, no. Like, if, if Arthur thinks that's a legitimately good idea, what does he stand to lose by saying to John, dude, that's a really good idea. Nice job. Nothing. You got to be really careful how you interface with people when they do something or say something that is desirable, that you want to perpetuate. Rewarding desirable behavior is important. You can punish desirable behavior and you will extinguish it if you're not careful. Would you do something with Jack? He seems kind of down. All this upheaval can't have been easy on the poor kid. Why? Because I'm your preferred nursemaid? Because you do what you say. Please. Okay. I'll take him in the morning. Thank you. Because you do what you say. Now, I'm going to make that comment a reflection of the general intelligence of the group. And I don't mean this to be disparaging. 
to the folks in this group. But I think we actually have to take intelligence into account here. And I think this is why Arthur is the implicit leader instead of being the explicit leader. Dutch is very abstract. Dutch's ideas. Dutch says he's going to do things. He says that things will happen, but it's all conceptual. Arthur, on the other hand, when he says he will do something or not do something, he follows through and that's tangible. And if you are the general populace of this group, concrete, visible, linear cause and effect in that way is going to be more appealing to you than abstract conceptualization. So when she says you do what you say, that's huge. That is such a reflection of why so many folks have respect for Arthur because he's concrete. They see the manifestations of the things that he says and they're clear and they're simple. Dutch is Mr. Complexity. People like Arthur can follow that. You know, the smarter folks in the groups can get, can get on board with that and can conceptually get in line with Dutch. But everybody else is kind of at the mercy of following the group. And again, this isn't an indictment on them. Their education is not really a thing back in this time. These folks don't have the same kind of opportunities to become smarter. But I think that's why Arthur is so reliable. Did you explain the difference between addiction to gambling versus drugs? Oh man, uh, yeah, so gambling addiction is one of the most difficult addictions to break a person of, if not the most difficult. The reason that gambling works on the human brain in the way that it does is that you have what's called intermittent rewards. Intermittent rewards means that it's impossible for you to find a pattern in when you will win. Thus, every single time you go in, you could win. There is always the chance when you gamble that it could pay off for you. Even if the odds are massively stacked against you, even if the odds are 99.9% .9 chance you are not going to win, there's always the 0.1% chance that you could win. And that wreaks havoc on the brain. Because our brain's not, like, our brain is equipped to look for patterns and to anticipate stuff. And so the intermittentness of the reward means that it's gonna keep chasing because you never know. When, and then you get cost sunk on top of that. And any time you could have the payout. Quite literally, the worst possible thing that can happen for somebody is if they gamble for the first time and they win. That is the worst case scenario. You walk up to a blackjack table and you throw 20 bucks down and you turn that into 300 bucks the first time you play blackjack. That's terrible because you have falsely sent a message to your brain that you could win at any time. And people chase that intermittent reward to devastation. People will bet the house literally because of the chance that they could recoup what they've lost at any given moment. It's really scary, wreaks havoc on people, and you actually need to have specialized treatment for gambling addiction because of how brutal it is from a psychological standpoint. Any idea of the hole I'm in? Oh, come on! Why has it always gotta be such a goddamn performance with you? Now, I told you I'd get you the money next week, and I'll get it. If you didn't make it this week, who's to say you'll make it next? Don't you take that tone with me. I thought you said you loved I me. I do. I do. But what I get paid ain't enough for one person, let alone two. Your money's got to be your problem now. The only problem I got is this bleating going on in my ear. Now lay off it, Lily. God damn it. That guy, big sucks. Why? He's trying to leverage his emotional connection and love with this person for a financial decision he made. This dude's in the hole. And he's like, I thought you loved me. That's not cool, man. That's not what this is about. This isn't about our relationship. This is about a decision you made that affects our relationship. You can't come in here using that shit. I can love you. I can think you're a good person and still recognize that you made a bad decision. One of the most difficult dynamics to work with in a relationship is over-personalization. This is when people conflate what they do with who they are. And whenever there's a criticism or a boundary set 
or you know anything of that nature a person looks at it as an attack on who they are on the essence of their relationship instead of paying attention to the fact that it's about something that they did and it can really put a person in in a bind when they're interacting with a person who over personalizes because they start walking on eggshells they start having to qualify things they start having to say look this isn't about you this is about the decision you made and if that person won't pull themselves out of that hole it can be almost impossible to interact with them. This guy's kind of doing that by saying, well, I, th I thought you loved me. This is uh, bad, bad, bad. It's all a deflection from in the accountability he has for paying this woman her money back. And now it's about to go right down the ladder because I'm going to ask her for my money. Arthur, Arthur, people are talking. You stopped. You stopped working for us all. How'd you mean? No money in the box for ages. Come on, son. You're the best man among us. Don't go weak on me now, please. I've been sort of busy, Dutch. I'll get back to it. Thank you, son. Are you fucking kidding me, Dutch? Kiss my cowboy ass. I have brought in so much money and done so much shit while you sit your ass in your fancy ass clothes, in your fancy ass tent, not contributing jack shit to the box. And you're going to come up to me and you're going to say to me, Hey, brother, been a while since you throw some money in the kitty. You have got to be kidding me. That has to be projection. I legitimately think that Dutch, by doing virtually nothing, seeing the camp stay in the same place for a long time, is probably feeling insecure about what he's contributing and as a way of overcompensating for it he's coming up to me and giving me shit for it so that it looks like he's competent and i'm incompetent that's how people orient themselves to a concept that's called splitting if you look at it as like competent and incompetent being incompetent is bad being competent is good if i recognize incompetence on my own self i'm gonna throw that out into others and interact with them as if they're incompetent so that i get to look competent so that people don't sniff out what's going on for me. And so Dutch doing that could very well be a reflection of his self-awareness of his inability to contribute to what's going on because there is overwhelming evidence that I am doing everything I can to support this camp. That's his problem, not mine. And because he's in the position of power, it's a lot harder for me to stand up to him. He's got a bunch of power mechanisms in place to be able to hold me down, make it look like I'm crazy, like I'm insubordinate, when in reality, I'm in a lot more in touch with reality than he is on this. Let's go see what's in this house. Escape. What the hell? Oh my God, is this like a Jonestown? Dude. I mean, I can say a little something about cults because if that's what this is, cults are scary. And the thing about cults that's important to understand is that literally all of us are susceptible to the influence of a cult if the circumstances are right. Cults prey on people who feel lost and who are particularly vulnerable and easy to be isolated out or are already isolated out. And what they do is they provide people with a very clear structure and purpose and role. They give them meaning, they give them belonging. They basically use all the basic needs of what it is to be human, particularly emotionally, and they provide that to you in a very stable, consistent, reliable, patterned way. And that is incredibly enticing to a person who feels lost and like they're not sure who they are. And then what they do is they create an us versus them mentality where if you're with us, you are, you know, you are great in the eyes of God or whatever deity they might see. You are, you are belong, you belong to the, the group. You are who the de leader deems worthy right you get to have that purpose and everybody who's outside of us doesn't understand us and is a threat and wants to hurt you and harm you and they cut you off from your support system who is very clearly going to tell you what you're doing is bad that's how people get caught up in it and then they get cost sunk they believe what the manipulative powers that be do because all that is is just coercing people often to make money sometimes for a you know for some broader sense of purpose but there's usually some sort of resource driven aspect to it and it'll get to the point where people will literally take potions to kill themselves you know in a place like jonestown it's really scary stuff 
but it preys on the need for connection and belongs to Lenny from Father. My dear Leonard, it is only three days since you and your mother stood on the platform so dutifully until my train was out of sight, and already I feel compelled to write. I know that I have sometimes been more tutor than father to you. Do not let my sermons on your future as a lawyer persuade you that I see you more as a pupil than son. When we meet again on Sunday next, I expect I will have stiffened once more, but this brief distance gives me liberty to tell you that you have redeemed more than you know, or can ever know, or should ever be expected to bear. I am as ever your loving father. I mean, I don't know Lenny's father, obviously, or the nature of their relationship, but yeah, five years ago, he kept it. This might be the, the most vulnerable or warm his father has ever been, for all we know. I mean, there are some folks that have a really hard time creating emotional intimacy when in proximity to people and when they have actual physical distance and find it in themselves to access a level of emotional vulnerability they may not otherwise compel themselves to access. And it makes me wonder if this letter is a representation of that for Lenny. This is, this is my father being as close to emotionally available as I've ever had him. As self-reflective as I've ever seen him. I mean, this could be a huge letter to receive if for no other reason, if Lenny has been going through his life, personalizing his father's interactions toward him. This shows that his father's reflective of that and is taking some accountability for it. Does that necessarily make it better with the way his father interacts with him? I don't know, it's hard to say. But this kind of thing can be really reparative, even though it's in writing, and even though it wasn't said to him directly. I mean, there's a there, there's no doubt in my mind that him keeping this for five years, is, there's a reason for that. This may be what he wishes his father could be, but never got the experiential opportunity to see him this way and then it makes me wonder you know lenny seems to be a guy who you know we went he went nuts at the bar you know, maybe he was under really strict rule as a kid and this this band of outlaws is his chance to act out against all of that he gets to find freedom in bucking the system he grew up feeling so impressed by the rules that were imposed upon him and the chores that he had and the coldness of his father that he decided he was going to resolve that for himself by joining a gang and running away and doing his own thing and finding finding belonging in a group that he could choose finding roles that he wanted instead of roles that he had to have but also because the group has needs and he needs to have a role there there's still a little bit of that structure that he's become accustomed to in terms of like the pattern of his environment. So it seems like a gang might be an ideal situation for Lenny because he gets to resolve some of the stuff that he had as a kid while also maintaining some of the patterns of interaction and group dynamic that he became accustomed to, even if he didn't like it. I mean, that's how childhood experiences can translate into adulthood. These girls, Mr. Morgan, they're driving me to despair. Why? No gratitude and no manners. This younger generation, it saddens me. The world is ruined. The amount of times older generations bitch about younger generations and don't realize that they're the ones that have reinforced environmentally and through nurture, the younger generation that they so deeply despise is just numbs my brain, man. If you don't like the younger generation and how they showed up, you got to reflect on how you raised them. Reflect on the choices you made about creating the environment that they are growing up within. This is like almost universal. The lack of self-reflection in older generations when they look at younger generations and what they don't like about them drives me nuts. It drives me absolutely nuts. And I'm not trying to make a generalization. I know there are folks in older generations that understand all this stuff. But my God, the amount of times people in younger generations hear that shit. I can't just say, yep, that person's got PTSD. That's reckless. Even though it's a video game character. I can't, you can't do that. Mental illness is not something that you just, you see one thing and you go, yeah, that person must have that. And too many of us, and by us, I mean just humans, too many of us do that. Oh, that person did something selfish. They must be a narcissist. Oh, that person likes things to be in an orderly fashion. They must have OCD. Oh, that person's anxious. They must have generalized anxiety disorder. Oh, that person has a hard time focusing. They must have ADHD. That's not how this stuff works. So I really kind of caution people to use that kind of language or to stay away from using that kind of language. Like it very well could just be that a person is just struggling to focus in that moment. It, it may be that the anxiety that a person's experiencing that moment is completely like to be expected because anxiety is not in an is not inherently a disorder to have. We get way too quick to pull the trigger on diagnoses 
instead of just allowing certain behaviors to be what they are. You have to do a full assessment as a therapist before you can ever provide a diagnosis to explain the behaviors that's going on for somebody. And these are behaviors that need to be present for long periods of time. I'm not talking a week. I'm not even talking a month. Like, we're talking years at some point. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? It's German? No. Strostos? Go, get out of here. Go. We need the land. Go. Get the hell out of they here. They took our father. Who did? Men. Last night. Where? Where did they take him? They ain't no business of ours. I don't even speak their language. All right, Arthur. Doing as tough and dense as all that. Come on, Arthur. This is the influence that I, I I hate to keep bringing this up, but like this is the influence that Dutch has on him. Arthur starts making really weird decisions when he's under the gun with Dutch. Dutch is like, go check this place out. Go do this. I worry, you worry. Blah, 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 blah. And Arthur just becomes this really callous, pointed guy. He's not he's not listening to this lady. He starts to re-engage with the I ain't a good person deal. So I'm really glad that Charles put him in his place there and says, you ain't dense enough to be like that. Because he's right. There's no reason for Arthur to be that callous there. There's really not. Other than him to be like thinking about, you know, Dutch said this has to be a certain way. Group's in trouble. I got a boom, boom, boom. I, this is absolutely an extension of Arthur's role in the group. And again, in Crisis, we see him tighten up and become callous. When we relax a little bit, Arthur becomes a little bit more autonomous. He gets a little bit more friendly. He takes on certain side jobs. It's very important to look at the difference in people's psyche when certain people are around versus others. And I love that Charles stands, Charles stands up to Arthur here. I have an immense amount of respect for him on that. My husband and I, we shared the work. All of it. I was out in the fields. I can hunt, carry a knife, or use a gun. But I tell you, you keep me here, I'll skin this fat old coot and serve him for dinner. Watch your damn mouth, you crazy goddamn fishwife. <laughs> Enough, both of you. Well, come with me then. You want to head out there? Run with the man? So be it. But we do more than just hunting. We're hunted. And them things hunting us, well, they got guns of their own. I ain't afraid of dying. Good. We need women with us. Uh, so, you know what? Good for her for standing up for herself. Her disdain for Pearson and for just chopping vegetables and stuff makes sense because she's back in a situation now where she doesn't have the kind of quality of life that she came to expect prior to joining our group. I can appreciate her advocating for herself. And as we're seeing, as men tend to annoyingly do, they're pushing back on the idea. And my guess is that they're pushing back on the idea because they have this internal sense that women are weaker than men. And I think what really goes on in this moment is if she goes out hunting with us and she does some of the stuff we're doing and she does it better, then the men are gonna have this whole inferiority complex about themselves that they're gonna project out and get aggressive about and be assholes about. Men just don't like it when they see the things that they perceive as weaker than them is stronger than them. Good for Sadie for saying, you know what, screw you. I, I wanna do it, I I'm gonna fight. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fight for myself, I'm gonna fight for my role, I'm gonna make it happen. I don't appreciate Arthur being a dick to her, so hopefully she puts him in, her, in his place. Apparently a famous gunslinger. Yeah, so they say, but uh, don't get what's famous confused with what's true. The ones of us that live that life, we was too busy being scared for our scalp to talk to no newspaper writers or dime novel men. Man, I guess they'll be on my way. Here. <laughs> well, thank you, Mrs. Bell. You gonna be all right? Oh, been running for 20 years. Suppose I'll be running till I drop. Just the way it is. Yeah. Good luck. This interaction with her is such a great illustration of the way our oversimplified internal representation of things prevents us from seeing context and getting closer to seeing people for who and what they are. This woman has survived for years on her own with no problem to the point that she's famous for it. And Arthur still sees her as woman first. Hence why he does these things like try to pick up the bag for her, ask her if she's gonna be okay, 
you know, express some level of doubt, ask how he could be of assistance. Arthur is of no use to her here. And so because he sees woman first and is biased in that direction and isn't, an, isn't acknowledging what seeing woman first is going to do for his interactions with her, I think he misses out on an even cooler conversation with her and respecting her for all that she has accomplished and realizing that, like, he ain't useful to her at all. So this is why it's important for us to understand our biases about the things we see first, because we can sort of take accountability for those things internally and go, all right, this woman probably doesn't need me. Let me just interact with her for what she is in the context that I have for her, which is that she's a badass woman that survived for this long without the help of anybody. And let me just get into that. That's really what I take from this. Like, she's really cool. I like her a lot. And Arthur's interaction with her is kind of like, Ugh. I'm well aware that we're not Royal Command performance material. Daddy, you were right, goddamn you! But a car barn in Rhodes is hardly Drury Bloody Lane. You got any word on the lion? Yes, yes, I've got word on the lion. Shit is the word. Someone saw him near Emerald Ranch. As you know, we're lately very short on lions. So, I'd be very grateful. All kinds of grateful. There's only one kind of grateful I care about. Y'all catch that little comment about daddy being right? As a hypothesis, I would venture a guess that Mr. Margaret's gregariousness and very obvious overcompensation for a sense of insecurity about his place in the world and about what he has to offer and about the quality of the work is in no small part due to the internalized object he has of his father, who is probably very disapproving of him. I think he's given us some indication to that even when we first met him. Well, this is what happens. People carry internalized objects of their caregivers and the people that were important to them in their formative relationships. And you will find that if they don't separate their own convictions from the convictions of those internalized objects, they will carry a sense of indebtedness to those folks and may make decisions in their life that are not in their best interest as a way to try to resolve that inner tension with that idealized figure that's in your mind. And so we see this in Mr. Margaret in the way that he is compensating and is presenting himself. And I'm not trying to attribute this all to like daddy issues per se, but having this internalized object of a father that you've never had the approval of and are seeking the approval of, he's never going to get it because he hasn't conceptualized what that would mean because he probably hasn't actually gotten it from his father. And so if this rings true for you, you have to be very careful to recognize that the approval of people that you had formative relationships with, especially if it's never going to actually come to you because that person sucks or that person just can't bring can't bring themselves to do it, that's not your problem. That's not for you to resolve for them. And it's important to separate yourself from that so that you can see what your values and convictions are in spite of that, so that you're living your life, not a life that's in reference to what you're carrying from when you were younger. You want to come with me? I'll show you how we hunt one. Sure. This is really nitpicky. I'm going to own that up front, but this is a word to the wise. When you make a statement about your experience of something and say that you want something in the presence of another person, that can be intense. And so many of us have learned to ask a question like Charles just did. So when Charles says, you want to come with me? Charles is probably saying, I'd like you to come with me. If you are a person that tends to ask questions instead of making statements because you're worried that making statements is too much for a person that it's going to obligate them to go with you because you said something you really ought to reconsider that when you ask a person that question when it really means a statement if arthur if charles says you want to go with me and arthur says no charles is going to read that as a confrontation to the statement as opposed to looking at it as Arthur just straight up not wanting to go. It would be the same as if Charles had said, hey, I'd like you to go with me, and then Arthur goes, nah. But that's okay if Arthur says that. Say what you need to say. I'd like you to come with me. Hey, I've been thinking about doing this. It'd be really cool if you joined me. If you're up for joining me, I would love it if you came with me. That's a lot different than just you want to come with it puts people on the spot when you're when you're veiling a statement with a question like that in a way that you don't want to put people on the spot. Me and Mary Beth have been so worried about you. Uh, you girls, you have beautiful hearts. Really, you do. I don't know about that. 
but we care about you. You seem very sad. My life took a turn for the worse when I took up with morphine and opium. I was told it would alleviate my suffering, and in many ways, they were correct. It made all my previous suffering just seem ridiculous. Now I had real suffering, and I lost everything. My vocation, my faith, my family. And but for Dutch and you poor people, I would have lost my life long ago. Um, I'm sorry about that. So am I. And yet I know in a few days I'll be back at it. If the Reverend doesn't believe that he's somebody worth worrying about, he's going to spin that in a direction where he's not going to see that as genuine care. And that's really, I think, the, the tragic part about how people get so encapsulated by their self-narratives. You see that they kind of brush people off. They don't accept help. They have a hard time with people showing that they care because they have don't know that they, like, they don't see themselves as somebody to be cared about. And so the reverend's trying to open up. He's got people who are here. They're willing to listen. They're trying to, they're saying, they're normalizing his experience, saying we all experience this like Arthur did. And the, the reverend just doesn't seem interested in that because the more that people validate it, the more real it is. And the more real it is, the more painful it is. And the more painful it is, the more he has to confront the fact that he hasn't developed effective coping strategies. So he's going to go back to the one coping strategy that makes it all go away, which is to get wasted. And this happens for so many people that struggle with drug abuse and alcoholism. It's understandable why he turns to these things, but this is why we want to intercept folks and teach them better coping mechanisms, build distress tolerance, because this is the kind of thing that the Reverend could get through and I think find some fulfillment in his life if he would only give it a chance and learn some of these more effective coping strategies. And that, I believe, would start with him accepting that other people see him differently than he sees himself. That's the step for the first step in my mind. But again, that does not mean that the Reverend is excused from anything he does while he's drunk. If he acts like a complete asshole, if he trashes the camp, if he runs away, he's accountable for that decision. We can empathize with his pain, but hold him accountable to his decisions. Now, we was preparing to rob the bank there until you got involved in all that nonsense, and I don't know, I just feel like it's unfinished business. That wasn't my fault. It was just one of them things. How come every time I get in trouble, I'm called a fool and an idiot? But when you get in trouble, oh, it's just one of them things. <laughs> it's a good point, Arthur. A very good point. All right, well, what do y'all want me to do? That is the power of numbers and accountability. That is Arthur being called out for the relative privilege he has in the group based on his position. That is beautiful. I love that Bill called that out. I absolutely love Arthur's not willing to take accountability for that. And Bill hits him for it. And Bill has the weight of the group behind it to say, yeah, Arthur, he's got a point. Arthur respects Lenny. It's huge. This is what Dutch is afraid of, by the way. This is why Dutch does the stuff that he does because it prevents people from saying this to him. I love that they all joined in on that. Because when you have a person who's the implicit leader of the group, you have a person with power. It takes numbers to hold those folks accountable and you do it through direct communication. And Bill's frustration is totally legitimate there. I love that. That just gave me extra respect for Bill because it speaks to the benefit of the doubt that we tend to give people that we idealize, who represent traits that maybe we wish we had or a position that we wish we had. We try to get in their favor. We'll let them pull it over on us. Oh, it was just an honest mistake, right? Language is super powerful here. It got called out through language, by the way. Bill's recognition of that was huge. And I love that as an example of how you call that out when you see it. Like I said, you mess up is just one of them things. I mess up. I'm the prize idiot. Well, Bill, I don't know what to tell you. Surprised you ain't already ripped me about that dynamite again. One mistake, and I'll never live it down. What do you need? Pat on the back? A medal? Just know, I got the lead on this one. Like, if I'm a therapist and I'm working with Arthur and Bill about their relationship, 
and this dynamic that's going on. What I would say to Arthur is, I think what Bill is saying to you, Arthur, is that he would appreciate the benefit of the doubt. Bill is saying that he feels boxed into a single story about himself, that he is the group idiot. It's not capable of getting anything done. And that even when he does get things done, you see that as an anomaly instead of as part of a patterned body of behavior and contribution to the group. I don't think this is about Bill wanting a pat on the back. I don't think this is about Bill wanting a medal. I don't think he needs anything tangible other than for you to give him the benefit of the doubt when he makes mistakes in the same way that people give you the benefit of the doubt and some acknowledgement of the things that he does do, right? And then what I'm saying to Bill is, you know, Bill, I appreciate that you're saying this to Arthur. And at the same time, I think if Arthur's going to make this effort to give you the benefit of the doubt and to give you this acknowledgement, you need to see it. You can't keep falling back on, oh, y'all just keep holding this over my head every time you're not getting the acknowledgement that you need because you're going to get some acknowledgement, but excessive acknowledgement isn't going to be good for you either. Arthur's going to make an effort here, but you also need to see it and acknowledge it when it comes through. This is going to take both of you. It's just you're on different levels of where you're going to be attending to this. People need acknowledgement for what they do. And benefit of the doubt is a core concept that I try to help a lot of couples get into. Not in a way that it enables, particularly if there's a pattern of issue, but generally if the relationship is healthy and not problematic, benefit of the doubt can go a long way to helping people solve problems. I shot a lot of folk like you. What you mean, folk like me? Oh, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, cowards. Good morning, Arthur. What an asshole. <laughs> hmm. You want to get shot too, Morgan? I've seen you in action. From that range, you'd miss. <laughs> the dick, man. Just shut your mouth, Micah. I say it how it is. You're out of line. In my mind, Micah is absolutely compensating for the fact that he's not held in high regard in the group. And it's becoming a self-perpetuating prophecy because he acts like a dick to try to show that he's got his shit together to compensate for the fact that people don't respect him. And in turn, the people around him don't respect him. If you really want a place in this group, you want to matter to this group in a way that Arthur does or Hosea does, you got to act like it. You can't go around antagonizing people. That doesn't actually give you power. Just makes you look like an asshole to the people who could promote you in. Now, if we're like good old boys that like that kind of thing, that's different. Then Micah would be doing the right thing, but not here. Like, Arthur's got too many intellectual sensibilities to look at Micah and say, damn, that guy's really working his way up the ranks. No, 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 no. Possibly, yeah. Home for so long now, I can barely remember a time when it was different. And you're still fighting him now. Make no mistake of that. Here he goes, Doubting Thomas. Is there any plan you ain't sour on? Oh, what a move by Micah. What a move by Micah. Micah is taking an action that, or a behavior that I'm expressing and spinning it to create hierarchical chaos to Dutch. Remember, loyalty is the thing that holds everybody into this group. And Micah calls me a doubter, which is the antithesis in some ways to loyalty. And he does it right in front of Dutch. That's a power move by Micah. That is Micah understanding the structure of this system and trying to subvert Arthur and win some favor on Dutch and gain a little tiny bit. That is so clever on his part to do that. Why language is so powerful because if I could have left this unpaused, then I think most of us would have just let that roll off. But that is one of the most impactful things that Micah could have said there in the presence of Dutch, calling Arthur that. Can we really afford to be fighting on all these fronts and O'Driscoll? There is wisdom in that. Uh, I hope so, gentlemen, but like I said, I'm nervous. Look, you ain't even going to be the one in danger. We'll get on over there. Find a nice perch for you to settle into. Then me and Dutch walk right in to the lion's den with you to cover us. <laughs> He's so good. Look at him. This is an O'Driscoll thing, and Micah is taking the lead. Not Dutch. Micah is the one who's talking about the plan. 
And you'll notice that Micah is also determining where the pawns in this are. And he's putting himself next to Dutch in that cave. That is smart. That is Micah trying to gain power and knowing exactly how to do it. Look at Arthur out in the back providing backup while me and Dutch are in the trenches navigating the O'Driscolls. We can't change what's done. We can only move on. But one day, we need to start learning from our mistakes. Come on, it ain't all bad. We've had a rocky run, but we'll be okay. We'll get through it. <laughs> Dutch will fix it. Dutch will come up with a big plan. Right now, every plan gets us into worse trouble. We're getting further from where we're meant to be going. Now, you can't put all this on Dutch. You're worked up, and rightly so. Just don't get too far in your head with all this. You'll never get out. Says the man who gets too far in his head with all this and can never get out. This is a perfect example of splitting. Splitting is a concept that is often talked about in psychodynamic therapy where we take a trait or a process and we see an oversimplified version of it that we split as either being good to have or bad to not have or vice versa. Skepticism is the split that we're going to talk about here. Loyalty is the thing that is seen in this group as being good. Skepticism would be the bad as it relates to this, okay? The lack of skepticism, good. Skepticism, bad. When Arthur is presented with a bunch of people who are loyal, he becomes skeptical. And we see his skepticism when he's by himself. Uh, and we we see that he kind of accesses that in a way that like, you know, we look at all these other people as being good and Arthur is looked at as bad for being skeptical about the group. And everybody works really hard to try to make sure that he's not skeptical. When Arthur is with John, and John now is expressing skepticism and is challenging the convictions of the group. Arthur splits and becomes loyal all of a sudden, right? John being skeptical, bad. Me being loyal, good. And I think it's really hard for Arthur to access his own skepticism because like he just said to John, it becomes a, it becomes a black hole that you can't pull yourself out of. When these guys think really hard about the group, they start to polarize against it. They start to realize that the group is indeed causing a lot of problems for them. In this case, the group's decisions led to John's son being taken away. Well, Arthur needs John to not think about it because that's the only thing that's going to keep John in the group and keep rolling. This group fractures if they start to think about all the consequences of the fact that their group is operating in the way that it is and is following the direction of Dutch and Hosea. This conversation with John is very interesting to me because we're seeing Arthur's resistance, I think, be a compensation for the fact that this is something that he thinks about a lot and he can't afford the empathy of John in talking about this because it means that the two of them might sit here and go, you know what, you're right. And then they're confronted with, but what does that mean for us if we don't believe in this group anymore? I find the brushwork baffling. What's he trying to represent aside from a filthy mess? It's a, you know. I'm sorry, I don't know. Well, let's just say, I can't say, not in mixed company. I'm not here to tell people what you should consider to be good art versus that's not what I'm here for. But I, I do want to give maybe a little bit of an explanation for why people would have a hard time. With it. Now, if this is an aesthetic that you don't like, that's okay. I respect that, right? Like if you look at this and you go, eh, it doesn't fit my taste. Cool. But when they're talking about like, you know, the brush strokes and that, you know, you have to re remember that like a lot of the people during this time, good artwork was considered to basically be one-to-one -one copy where it was like a photograph essentially. So when you get guys like Charles that come in here and they start to represent things more abstractly, it makes people think. So people who are accustomed to looking at a piece of art and knowing exactly what it is and what it's supposed to be, there's not a lot you have to think about there. It's not effortful for your brain to have to interpret a piece of art. Instead, you look at it and you go, oh yeah, it's a portrait of George Washington. Cool. He was the president. Great. I know what it is. I don't have to interpret it. Much. But then you get something like this where it's like this faceless woman who is not represented in a one-to-one -one way that we have come to anticipate, like this is what a human looks like. All of a sudden, it creates a little bit of dissonance in a person's brain because now I'm being asked to interpret this. 
I'm being asked to look at this and step into the mind of another person who's represented a woman laying on a bed differently than I would have conceptualized it. And I have to ask myself what it means. And a lot of people don't like when they can't figure out what something is. Because again, from an evolutionary perspective, that's risky. So these people looking at art and being like, I don't quite know how to make sense of this. I don't know what it means. It's requiring a level of abstract thought that they very likely aren't used to exercising, even if they're educated. And so it makes people uncomfortable because a lot of times too, people are conditioned to think that they're supposed to just know what it is, right? You're supposed to be able to look at a picture or look at a device and know what it is. And when we look at something and we can't quite figure it out immediately, or if it seems like there's a point to it that we're missing, then it creates all sorts of projections that we have about our incompetence and our lack of intellect and all these sorts of things. Where people will look at art sometimes and feel dumb because they can't figure out what it is or why it was painted or drawn or whatever in a certain way. The reality is it's not about you being dumb. It's about art being an interpretive abstract thing that doesn't always have a simple direct answer. People who like concrete things will tend to struggle with that a lot more than people who are open to the idea of abstraction interpretation. Don't worry. You know the letters. You know the sounds. You're nearly there. I got no use for stupid books. I don't have any use for stupid books. If you ain't, why are you making us do it? No, you should say, I don't have any, not I got no. <laughs> I think you may be confusing things a little now, Brother Dorkins. Probably. Go over it first in your head. Take your time. A quick opportunity for me to talk about scaffolding. If you're interested in learning theory, I have a video on YouTube that you may be interested in watching that goes into significant depth on how people learn. Anxiety is part of learning. This kid being distressed by learning how to read is part of the process. And it would be very important to this nun here to explain this to him, right? Like the frustration that you're experiencing as you're trying to learn a new skill is part of the gig. In fact, if you're frustrated, that actually means that you're being presented with something that you have the ability to learn, right? It's not something you've already learned because it's new. And scaffolding is basically helping a person going go from completely assisted, in this case, having it something read to you, being unaided, and you slowly remove the instructor's role over time to facilitate the person being more self-sufficient relative to the skill, in this case. So if you're a person that wants to learn a skill, wants to do something new, wants to get better at something, or learn an entirely new concept or language or something like that, you need to know going into that, that when you experience frustration, that is okay. And that is actually part of learning. You can't learn without frustration. That challenge is important. You want things to be just beyond your competency so that you can push through various layers of development in order to get to more advanced competency in a thing. And if you embrace the fact that frustration is going to be a part of that and expect it as opposed to expecting that it's gonna go smoothly, you build some distress tolerance around that, you're gonna find that you can learn things a lot quicker, especially if you have the right instructor. We got you, your son, everything. We got him. Mama. He's fine. I'm fine, mama. They fed me good. <laughs> Italian food. <laughs> you ever eat that? Come here, you silly boy. <laughs> you got him. You got my son back. Dutch, Arthur, thank you. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> Looking in John's face, Abigail says, you got my son back, and then says, thank you, Dutch, and thank you, Arthur. If that doesn't tell you where Abigail is, wow. This is tricky because different people have different values about whether a child should have parents both present in their life. If Abigail perceives John to be a legitimate threat to Jack's well-being, not out of personal spite for him, but because she thinks that John's lack of reliability is a detriment to Jack's experience, her creating that split in front of Jack is not necessarily a bad thing. But this gets really tricky because Jack is going to hear that kind of thing. And he doesn't have the sophistication and understanding of language and abstract concepts of relationship dynamics 
to understand just how much context goes into Abigail saying my child. But he's going to hear that in some kind of way that separates Abigail from John. It could be adaptive for her to say this. But she has to be careful because if she's saying that because out of spite for John, when in reality John is showing up now in a way that is meaningful and good for Jack and allows for some extra stability in Jack's life, her creating that split is not necessarily healthy for Jack. I don't know which one is the right way to go, but that's a very powerful message to send. You got to be real careful as a parent saying shit like that in front of your kid. You really do. Especially if you're trying to create a cohesive parenting relationship, whether you are still together or not. But damn, if that doesn't give us insight into how she feels about him. You had to live by your code. But your code is... Well, it's not right. Has your way been right, Mary? With you? And Jamie joining a bunch of crazies? An hypocritical daddy with his drinking and horn and gambling? Huh? Is that what a pure life has gotten you? Begging me for help? Oh, Arthur. Be kind to me. <laughs> Please. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, that's a big no for me, dog. I am. I should have asked someone else. But. But I'm the best guy you know at frightening decent people. It wasn't that I didn't love you. No, 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 no. Oh, Arthur. We were so very young. Think how different life could have been. Yeah, I think about it. A lot. It all seems so long ago and far away now. Will you help me try to save daddy? No. No. What Molly is not empathic toward is Arthur's experience of all of this. And I think that's what is most unsettling. There's very little respect for Arthur's experience of the relationship, of the breakup, of talking to her now. When you make a decision to set a boundary with a person, for whatever the reason, you are never under obligation to reciprocate a relationship with somebody who's interested in you ever whatever your reasoning is for not doing that is totally okay even if you do it when you like them back which it seems like mary did or at least is how she's trying to explain it in hindsight however when you set that boundary with somebody it is not fair to leverage the extra interest that that person has in the relationship to have a person do things for you that they would not otherwise do if they were not emotionally invested in you. That is unfair. That is disrespectful to a person, and that is over-leveraging that person's investment in the relationship. Now, that person absolutely is within their right to set boundaries with you when that happens, but it's a very chaotic thing to do, to say, I'm not interested in you in that way, but please, I'm going to invite you in just a little bit farther than I might other people. I'm going to build you up just enough that you will do stuff for me. It takes two people to tango, but she has power here, given that Arthur's emotionally invested in her. And with that power comes responsibility for the relational dynamic that you're trying to facilitate. This is why I do not like what she's doing. I don't want you to work in that mine no more, okay? Would you rather go back to thieving? Hmm? I'm providing for my family. Well, you can't provide for us if you ain't got no lungs. And what if it caves in again? Well, I told you a hundred times already. It'll get better. Yeah, sure. And who's gonna change things around here? You? Jameson? He'll work you to death. I've, I've had enough. I'm gonna go put food on the table probably looking at this as an outside observer and you're going, man, there's got to be a better way to communicate about that. And you are correct. There is. See, thing is, anger and frustration are often a hell of a lot easier to express because it allows us in an interaction to put distance between ourselves and the person that we're talking to. Vulnerability brings them closer. If I was facilitating this conversation as a therapist, I would be working to help them keep their intensity of their voices down. But what they're really saying, what she's really saying to him is, I don't want to lose you. You being around is more important to me 
than whatever notion you have about needing to provide for this family. And I would work to get her to say that and for him to listen to and validate that. I'm wondering if the two of you would be willing to put your heads together to potentially try to problem solve this now that you are more closer to validating each other. Because the thing is, they're trying to kind of problem solve this by yelling at each other. And that's not working. That's creating distance. That vulnerable exchange where you share what's going on, kind of take your survival strategy down and you access your vulnerability more and you get some validation for that, starts to positively reinforce a connection. Something where we start to feel closer when we have these difficult conversations rather than distant from each other. Because it is rare for me to ever see couples who can solve problems by continuously pushing distance into their interactions. It just doesn't really work that way. Doesn't mean that he has to go quit his job today, but it does mean that maybe they can figure something out as a family to, to go forward, right? Because what we're looking at is I'd be looking at him going like, dude, your wife's scared. She's scared. Can you please interact with her as if she's scared as opposed to antagonistic? And that may change his interaction. This little moment here and watching the two of them, I'm sure they have this all the time. They're probably tired of it. They probably feel like they're at an impasse. This is where a couple's therapist can step in and try to sort of scaffold this conversation to be a lot more vulnerable and close as opposed to distant. Listen, I realize that it is a ridiculous request, but we're very desperate. Yeah. I'm not a do-gooder, Mr. Miller. Gentlemen, I'm very sorry for your predicament, but... I'm a working man. I got problems of my own. We will pay you very handsomely, Mr. Morgan. How much? I told you, they're all mercenaries. <laughs> <laughs> There's a price on my head in two states, my friend. The government doesn't like me any more than it does you. Like you, I've been running for as long as I can remember. And like you, my time here is nigh undone. We understand and we will pay. Your future decisions and actions are not already determined by your past. When Arthur says, I ain't a do-gooder, as a justification for not assisting these folks, even though maybe his sensibilities are that he would like to, he's making that connection. He's basically saying, I'm a bad person who does bad things, thus I can't help. So many folks fall into that trap. Literally any given moment in time, including this current moment in time. Any one of us has the opportunity to make different choices. Arthur, at any point in his journey, could decide, you know what, I'm going to do something because I think it's the right thing to do. I do not have to make a decision that reflects this preconceived notion that I'm an asshole. I, in fact, could do something different. Now, there are consequences to that, as we've talked about many times throughout this playthrough, right? That the more he gets in touch with his own values and a sense of good, perhaps that distances him from the group that he, you know, loves so dearly and the people in it. But Arthur continuing to use this excuse that he's a bad person, thus he can't do these things, is ridiculous. He, at any point, can choose to do the right thing or choose to do something that's in his best interest even if he doesn't want to do it. That's discipline. Sometimes it takes discipline to do the right thing. You all seem to have forgotten how money is made and what it takes to support 20 people, let alone what it takes to give 20 people a new life overseas. With all due respect, Dutch, is this Tahiti plan really going to work out? You tell me, Arthur. Is it? I encourage anybody who is frustrated by this exchange that's happening right now, I encourage you to look more into what's called the backfire effect. The reason I bring up the backfire is because when people are really polarized into a position, in this case, like Dutch is polarized into this idea that they're going to go to TV. When people are presented with counter information or doubt or dissonance, many of us think that if we instill that in a person, it's going to bring them closer to us. If we can get that person to just see the way that we see it, they will move closer to the middle. And in fact, the opposite happens. When people are deeply loyal and polarized into an ideology, and they're presented with information, even if that information is 100% objectively and factually accurate, people will polarize into their position. Do that to save face. They do that because it is often perceived that if a person changes their mind or comes off of that 
position of loyalty that they are weak, that they are no longer necessarily ideologically aligned with the group, and that they may be cast out of that, which evolutionarily is not a survivable circumstance. So you're seeing in some ways an interplay of the backfire effect that's going to happen here. Arthur is like, this ain't going to work. And Dutch is like, yes, it is. And both of them are going to vie to try to get the other one to come in their direction. And it's only going to push us farther apart. What makes political discussions very difficult right now? Because people have been cornered. And because being cornered and engaging in your own position, one that you can anticipate and that you understand better, is a mitigation of cognitive dissonance, which is like the number one thing our brain wants. That's the process of what's happening here. You take the words and the content out of it. We this is absolutely a jockeying for for power and ideology. I feel like I'm going in circles with all of you. Micah is the only one left with any Oh man. That ain't fair. You are talking like John. I swear that woman is poisoning him against me. I've oh, seen it before. Shit. What's the problem here? There ain't a problem. You think Micah would question going after Bronte? No, he'd say, let's go. Because what he just did is something that anybody who has a uh, history of abuse, emotional ma manipulation in your life, you've heard something like that before. And I'm sure that was not fun to hear. This is how to manipulate the folks you abuse into thinking it's their fault. One over. When you dissent, when you go against me, when you hold me accountable, you hurt me. Not I'm hurt. You hurt me. You love me, don't you? If you love me, how could you do something that hurts me? This is rock bottom. Right here. This is abusive parent to child. Abusive partner to partner. This is the kind of thing that an abuser does. Lost in their own spirals. Feel like they're out of control. So they overcompensate and do everything they can to make to defer that maintain control i'm only dysregulated because you're making me we're only in this situation because you aren't loyal i'm doing everything i can for you look at me bending over backwards all i'm looking for is just some appreciation and some loyalty and when you hold me accountable that hurts a lot this is beyond gross at this point and if I'm Arthur, I'm turning my horse around. I'm saying, fuck you. Find Micah if you want. You do whatever you need to do. I am not putting up with this shit. And I'm out. Kids don't have the opportunity to do that with their parents. People, the number one reason people don't leave abusive relationships is because they think they're, they, they're afraid that the abuser is going to kill them. Or it's unsafe to get out. What was that? Horrible old crone. But you killed her. She was going to betray us, Arthur. Couldn't you tell? No. Well, I got some Spanish. She was. Oh, you dick. Folk, I'm just trying to make sure that some of us survive, Arthur. Now, no, shall you're we not. proceed? You think I want any of this? I don't know. Of course I don't. But I made a pledge to you all. We would survive, no matter what. So how did you know she was going to betray us? What'd she say? It was in her eyes, in the way she was leading us. But you said you knew Spanish. I know human beings. Art. Are you gonna strangle me next? I'm doing the best I can. This is the power of a self-narrative and the way that it leads to certain behaviors if you're not careful, okay? Dutch's apology was a gateway into us understanding the template through which his future actions here are built on. You have to remember what happens when you experience dissonance is you get aversive arousal. Dutch's main goal in these interactions with Arthur is to mitigate as much of that cognitive dissonance as he possibly can, and he's doing it strongly through assimilation. He is working his ass off to save face in these conversations to a point that it doesn't make sense. He is going to continue to polarize into his own decisions making sense as the overcompensation for the insecurity rather than entertain the idea that maybe Arthur is right. Because if he entertains the idea that Arthur is right, he loses every piece of himself and his narrative that he holds dearly. And Dutch cannot afford to do that at this point in his mind. So he's going to just keep 
just anchoring himself down into these narratives. And if you're thinking to yourself like, Jesus, I would never do that, you're probably wrong. Almost all of us would do this unless we had a really strong cognitive understanding of what's going on. Dutch is under an immense amount of pressure and he's not releasing the pressure in ways that are healthy. He's doing it through secluding himself, building a new narrative, becoming paranoid about the world around him, perceiving everything as uncontrollable and overcompensating with that control based on a promise that was made with an entirely different context. Arthur is the one who's a lot more lucid right now and lucidity in the contrast to paranoia is going to appear to be crazy and Dutch needs to make Arthur look crazy instead of him looking crazy. And that's where we see an intersection of some psychodynamic stuff. We have to be lucid. Well, if Arthur's lucid, that means I'm not. I have to overcompensate into I'm lucid, therefore Arthur's crazy. I need Arthur to be crazy because if Arthur's crazy, he's bad. I can control that variable. We can't change what's done. We can only move on. You have it in you, I can tell. What happens here is people are left to make meaning of this. People want to understand why things have happened to them this way. They want it to make sense. People don't like random stuff. Don't like the idea that we have randomly contracted tuberculosis. So Arthur is going to be left to make some meaning out of this situation. If I had to take a guess, my guess would be that Arthur is likely to view this as a natural punishment for all the bad that he's done. Perhaps I deserve this because I've hurt lots of folks. Sometimes that helps people. Like, you know what? I can make my peace with this because I made it this long. I hurt lots of folks. Here it is catching up with me. Maybe he blames somebody. This wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Dutch. Deferring of blame is another way that people try to move through the grief process with something that's, a, that's happening to them. We try to assign blame because we try to make meaning. We want to know the linear direction that things happened and why they happened. Quite frankly, sometimes learning why it happened doesn't actually matter. And I think something that's important for all of us to consider is that you get to choose what meaning you make out of this, what you attend to, where you go, what you do. Sort of like what Arthur just said. You can't change what happened, but you can change how you move forward. Which means that you do have it in you to make a more empowering narrative. One that, you know, maintains some level of dignity and integrity and is kind to yourself. Because this is something that would be very hard for a person to understand if you don't want to help me but but i think of you often yep thinking about key moments in his life he's thinking about key relationships he's asking himself the what ifs right he's been confronted with his mortality if we don't stop soon we'll all be dying so we've had hosea we've had brother dorkins we've had mary we've had arthur's own voice right we're hearing the voices that have had a significant impact on him well she was a fool then Come on, let's get that poor girl out of the cage. No! We ain't gonna hurt you. <laughs> Please don't kill me. It's okay, miss. It's okay. Shh. You're safe. It's okay. As a reminder about trauma, Trauma registers for folks when there's a gross violation of expectation that's coupled with a lost sense of safety and security. This woman absolutely had that, right? She can't believe that people would do this. She's locked in the cage. What happens in that moment is your brain registers everything that's going on in that moment. All the circumstances from where she was kidnapped to the cage she was in. This includes smells, types of people that she's around, what she's wearing, what the time of day was. I mean, there's all sorts of things that her brain is going to register. It could very well have been a bird that made a funky noise when it happened for her that if she hears that bird again, oh my God, right? Like that's going to potentially be something that can trigger her down the line. That vigilance in her brain is something that she involuntarily now has to live with and learn to navigate. One of the things that makes trauma super unfair and shitty for people is that you are left to pick up the pieces of the trauma that you experienced, even though you didn't ask for the trauma to happen in the first place. And so part of the work with her is going to be helping her understand her triggers, help her understand the circumstances that were around that, so that if she notices that she gets flinchy in times where it wouldn't actually be adaptable to be flinchy, she can kind of have some understanding of that. She may be on guard for a little while here, 
because she has to protect herself, and that's what her brain's going to try to do. This is my camp. Get lost. Time for you to get the hell out of here. You got it, sir. I will get the hell out of here. It's a completely different reaction when somebody does something like that in these kinds of games. I take it as a challenge. Like, yeah, what are you going to do about it? Now, come on. <laughs> I mean, the guy set a boundary with me. Why would I? What? I'm not a fan of looking at boundaries as challenges. In fact, I would make an argument that literally that you should literally never look at a boundary as a challenge. You should look at a boundary as a boundary. So if a person says, please leave me alone, that's not a challenge to fight the boundary. That is them very clearly stating their expectation of you. I roll up on that guy's camp and he says, please get out of here. I'm leaving. If the guy says what the other guy said at the beginning of the episode, he says, come have a seat at my fire. Let's talk. All right, cool. I'm down. You should never look at boundaries as a challenge. You should look at boundaries as a sign of respect that a person was willing to assert their expectations of that given context. And you're certainly welcome to set whatever boundaries you need. But a boundary is a boundary. And if it's stated clearly, we have to listen. I wasn't sure if you'd be able to help. I mean, Rain's fall has also Thank showed himself to be a man of integrity. You have already done so much. Ain't a problem. Thank you for helping Captain Monroe to retrieve those vaccines, Arthur. He will be at the meeting and is one person who knows the true situation, at least. Something I want to say about Rain's Fall as we make this trip here that stands out to me in contrast to many of the other characters that we have come across in this game, and I think is partially why I, and I'm assuming many of you watching this, are drawn toward him and are feeling this sense of, like, calm, even though we're going into chaos with him. Something he does that nobody else does is he thanks us continuously. He acknowledges the sacrifices that we make in helping him. And he takes time to really see our involvement for what it is and to express his appreciation. What that does is it reinforces for us that we matter to him. And it's a reward. It's an interactional, relational reward when a person we respect says i appreciate you for doing this particularly as often as he does it's in stark contrast to the many people who when we talk with them they just kind of take it for granted they might say thank you after but this guy is constantly reinforcing that and what we can learn from that is when people do things that you appreciate express that appreciation thank folks for the stuff that they do while they're doing it not just after they do it make it a process reward not just an end award and you will often find that people are going to be a little bit more drawn toward you because they feel seen amongst that process and not as if they're being used appreciation goes a long way for folks i guess uh, i'm afraid there is nothing to be afraid of mr morgan Take a gamble that love exists and do a loving act. All aboard. I shall try. I know you will. The sister's right. He at any point in time can not only choose what he does, but also how he thinks about it. See, because one of the things that Arthur has been slave to throughout this entire series so far is confirmation bias. Arthur has already decided that he's a bad person, that bad things should happen. And as a result, he has biased himself inadvertently into looking at all the things that confirm that for him. And probably has even gone so far as to retcon his history to suit that narrative. I lost Mary because I'm a bad man. Daddy treated me this way because I'm bad. Like, I mean, he. there's all sorts of ways that he can retcon his history in that way. And what the nun is saying here is, you don't have to continue to perpetuate that narrative. And I think Arthur's known that for some time. We've seen that over the last couple episodes and how he has interacted with people and what he has chosen to do, like helping out the downs, helping out the natives on his own volition, not accepting money and payment for that. Like he's started to get there. And I do wonder if this lady saying this to him is enough after he was in a moment of vulnerability for him to say, you know what? I don't have to be slave to that narrative. If Arthur's a bad person, having TB 
is easier for him to conceptualize and understand. He can fit that into the narrative of, you know what, I deserve it. If Arthur brings himself around to seeing himself as a good man, as a person who's capable of engaging in deeds that are for the betterment of not just himself, but the people around him, you know, that he could be somebody who would have been a great father if he didn't lose his son, a person who has some form of moral compass that goes in the direction of trying to be the best man he can be. Tuberculosis all of a sudden sucks a lot more. All of a sudden, it doesn't feel fair. As Arthur continues to do good things, we are brought closer and closer to his tuberculosis. He coughs more. It's showing up in missions. Now, all of a sudden, we got this guy who's doing good, and this illness is taking him out of it, and it's hard for us to sit with because we're like, holy shit, man, you don't deserve this anymore. And he's going through that same scramble of narrative. So much of Arthur needing to kind of look at himself and reevaluate not just who he was, but like, who does he want to be going forward? How does he want to use the time that he has left? And him getting these subtle bits of reinforcement from the folks around him, I think is huge in him accomplishing that and hopefully making some really significant meaning out of the rest of his life. What's going on? Listen, I know we ain't always seen eye to eye and uh, you find me irritating and a threat and I like to annoy you. But right now, I need better from you, Arthur. Okay, Dutch. You know, as much as I hate it, I admire it. I do. I really do admire it. I admire his ability to do this. He's just using it for bad. You could use this for good, but he's using it for bad. Empathizing with a person like Arthur in this case is a very strong way to subtly pull somebody over onto your side and get them to listen. He did a really nice job there. I know I annoy you. I know I dig at you. I know that you're frustrated with me. This is an exact conversation that we had with Dutch at like part three. You remember that? We were hitching up the horses back where it was snowy and, and Dutch kind of acknowledged, I know you think I'm a pain in your ass, yada, yada, yada. And it got Arthur to listen. It's exactly what Mike is doing here. It's a really great tactic to get Arthur to listen, even if Arthur doesn't want to. Because the thing is, from a relationship standpoint, we desire connectedness and being seen and heard and understood and validated. And even if, and that can happen from people that we don't like, it can happen from an abuser, and it does in some ways draw us in. And people who know how to use that in a manipulative way are scary. Micah is doing that right here. Oh, oh the dig. All he found was arsenic and lead. I dug down into the cave system and spread. I was meant to uh, get you all to go. Uh, now you heard it. It's taken me. Uh, oh, oh, dear. Uh, dear God. Oh, there's no arguing. It's clear as day. We're cursed. <laughs> cursed? What are you talking about? Powerful forces have taken on this town. It ain't oh, spirits. Yes. It's a mining company. No, it is spirits. Spirits taken through a mining company. Brothers and sisters, we got some praying to do. Yes. Don't pray. Do something. You'll die. Or you worse. Just go. It's our curse. It's ours to deal with. Now the medicine man left some money. They just take it if you want it. That's another beautiful example of assimilation. It's so hard for people to do a 180 on something that they hold deeply. It's really hard. And it takes a lot of effort on a lot of fronts to get people away from it. This is why grabbing people at vulnerability or childhood is so important for people who are trying to manipulate the masses because it's really easy to give an initial story, an initial narrative, an initial idea. In this case, demon. Really easy. When there's uncertainty, people look for direction. When they find direction, they go with it because it gives them a story. And if you're really good at cultivating that for people, they will follow you till the end of time. It's so much harder to get people away from their initial narrative and impression than it is to get them into it in the first place. And that's terrifying. These folks, it's gonna take a ton of work to get them away from that. I mean, you saw it, even in the face of that, they say it's demons working through the mining company, right? Demons still exist. Brutal, man. That's why you gotta be real careful with kids. It's why, it's why so many groups try to target children. Because if you can get if you can get children, you can get them real young. Very hard to get them away from it. it. Takes a lot of education, diverse representation, the whole nine yards. This is all going to plan. We rob Uncle Sam and we leave. <laughs> the poetry of it all. 
What do you think? It sounds wonderful. Hell, yeah. I ain't got much to lose, but... You know, the women and the children. And John and his family. I'm afraid I have to insist. I mean, we gotta let them go, because if the Pinkertons come through again, they will kill everyone. Insist? Yeah. Insist. Of course, pal. Whatever you think is best, I will see to it. Huh? Well, yeah. Now, we gonna rob a train? Sure. We will survive. We will flourish. We have work to do, my friends. Let's go. Come on. We are gonna borrow a little money from old Uncle Sam and be out of his hair once and for all. He insists upon it. He insists. Oh. Take a look at that face. Okay. Take a look at that face. You want to know what just happened? You want to know what just happened in Dutch's head? Arthur is the new Colmo Driscoll. Dutch needs somebody to hate. Needs an individual to download all of his self-doubt into. Tolerable for him to hold it in himself. Tolerable for him to take a realistic view of himself. So he takes it and throws it into Arthur and he polarizes against him. This is 100% the moment that we lost Dutch because this next mission is now a personal mission that has been fully personalized and is now about Dutch dick measuring with Arthur and the group's gonna suffer for it. Should I just sneak on now? God damn it. <laughs> well, everybody mount up. We still going through with this? Of course we are. No. If you have... <sighs> Take a breath, Ryan. Take a freaking breath. Okay. <laughs> Honestly, kudos to Rockstar for getting me so fucking invested in this game that I'm literally, that I'm legitimately pissed off right now. This is how you know that Dutch does not have a well thought out plan. You do not shoot from the hip. Okay. It didn't go to plan. We turn around, we regroup, and we come up with a new one. We don't fire from the hip this is 101 because now we are reactionary the whole reason you set up a plan and you share the plan with other people and you get them involved in the plan and you give them roles and you give them ideas you do that to be proactive you do that to control the engagement because the more control you have the more likely you are to succeed as soon as this train blew past us, we are now reactive, which means we are in a subordinate position, which means now it's a chain reaction of compensations, which is impossible to coordinate without really solid leadership. We are now off of the plan. Dutch is going to act like this is fine and like we can make up for this and we can get it back to part three and part one and two didn't go the way we thought it would. This is how... Terrible things happen. You bail, you go back to the campsite, you regroup, and you figure it out. There is no shame in that. But Dutch is going to save face, and he's going to force us to go do this, and it's going to monumentally fail. Control the engagement. Work with known quantities. We are out of control in this engagement. The train is now an unknown quantity. Terrible. <sighs> I 
was having a really awesome conversation with my wife earlier today, actually. And for anybody who's watching the VOD who doesn't know this, my wife is also a therapist. And every once in a while, my wife and I will get onto conversations about just really deep conceptual stuff that we see all the time as therapists, because we work with people for a living something that matters to us. We somehow got on the conversation of what it's like to be around not just clients, but just people in general who believe that they are slave to their narrative. People who see the world themselves, their behaviors, their thoughts as things that happen to them. Things like, I can't do this. You know, Arthur saying, I can't do good. I'm a bad man that people hold on to these narratives so deeply that they, they don't look at themselves as having autonomy amidst that, as having power to do something different. That at any given moment in time, Arthur could do a loving act like the sister says at the train station. You do not have to be slave to a self-defeating narrative about yourself. You do not have to act in a way that's in accordance with something that got pushed inside of you by people that were around you. Any moment in time, you can choose an alternative path. Dutch continually chose to make poor decisions. Arthur, toward the end of the game, started to value his ability to make choices. And we see that as the gamer. We see that. We get to start making choices. We get to start flexing some of that autonomy for Arthur. At any point, you can choose to do something different. At any point, I could choose to go for the money. I could choose to go for John Marston. That's my choice to make. I do not have to serve my own internal narrative that I have reinforced over time. I don't have to do things to reinforce that I'm a bad person if I'm Arthur Morgan. Becoming something else, creating change for yourself, redeeming yourself, if that's how you want to put it, takes intention, it takes effort, it takes work, it takes discipline, it takes recognition that you have more power and control in your life than you realize, and doing something with it. Arthur did. And I think as a result of that, Arthur died on that hill at the very least knowing that he was making that effort when he died. Dutch, when he turns and walks away, is the absolute antithesis to that. That's a man who turns away and walks away and is slave to his narrative. A man who's not willing to challenge the fact that maybe he could do differently. Where's Jack? Shoveling shit in pursuit of the better life you want. Same as I've been. Well, won't do him no harm. <sighs> oh. I get to put my couples therapist hat on for this. Again, this is where the judgment is going to cause problems. If John doesn't work his way through this, because when he says to Abigail, there, shoveling shit like I am for the life that you want, he is deferring his own accountability to her saying that it's her fault that he's making these decisions, which is total bullshit. You can't cherry pick this. You can't take all the bad aspects of what it is that you're doing or that you don't like, and then defer the accountability over to Abigail and say, well, you know, I'm doing this because this is the life you want and I'm trapped in this. No, you're not, John. In fact, you you don't have to stick with Abigail and Jack. You, you could have gone elsewhere. It would have not been a great thing to do, but you do not get to make decisions to hang around your family and to provide for your family and to do it the right way and then hold it over your wife's head and say that it's because of her her that you're doing stuff you don't like she ain't holding the gun to john's head telling him he has to do it this kind of stuff like happens way 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 too often giving people power like in a backhanded way this is what you wanted i'm in a shitty mood because i'm doing this because this is what you wanted it's your fault no it ain't john Only always trying to get to me do. on coffee well, no undertakers like me cattle not so much that ain't true I ain't no rancher Rustled horses, not raised them. Stole cattle, not birthed them. I was, I was reading the newspaper. I was reading about a... This is the most vulnerable we've seen John. This is him talking directly. This is him saying what's going on for him. He's struggling. He's struggling with identity. This is vulnerable. Literally. The first thing Abigail needs to do is engage with him on that. Listen to him. Don't run away from the anxiety that you experience when you hear him saying that. I, sh I am sure that when Sadie hears John say that, the first thing she does 
is lock on to her narrative, which is, oh no, he wants to go back. John didn't say that. And honestly, until John says that, that narrative is irrelevant. People do this all the time. They get so wrapped up in their own narratives to things, what they hear instead of what was said, like Abigail here, and they orient themselves to that. But that thought makes Abigail anxious, so she avoids it by diverting over and saying what she read in the paper and leaves John hanging when John did the thing that we would want him to do here. This is a perfect example of punishing desirable behavior. If you are ever in a situation and a person that you care about expresses some vulnerability your way, at the very least, acknowledge it. At the very least. Even better, affirm it. Well, I got some things to take care no, of. No, not a problem. I'll come too. No, you don't have to. Oh, no, I'm real sick, John. Lumbago. It's a slow and painful death, my brother. Evidently. Oh, have a little pity, will you? Huh? Come on, then. All right. Oh, John. This is what I'm talking about. Oh, man. John is going through the same process that Arthur went through and that so many video game protagonists go through. John has to set and follow through with boundaries. Bring in Uncle along. It's very clear that John doesn't necessarily think it's a good idea, but he breaks his own boundaries. He sets a boundary. He says, no, uncle. Uncle blows past it. John lets him go. A boundary is not a boundary unless you hold firm to the boundary. Maintain it and set consequences. Say no, John. The allure of the old life is always going to be there. It's like alcoholism. It's like when people go sober. Alcohol will be in your life. It will be in the environment. It's very hard to curate a total environment where there's absolutely no alcohol available. to you. Full on true advanced sobriety is when you can maintain your sobriety when you are around the substance that you were once beholden. For John, that means he needs to have the boundaries while he's around the folks that he used to be around. Some of who may be acting in his best interest, like Sadie perhaps, some of who who might not, like Uncle. It's hard to trust Uncle here. And you can see it in John that he is hesitant to do this. It's really hard to establish a new life. I saw somebody in chat ask the question, how do you create a new identity for yourself? How do you move on? It's through boundaries. And John just collapsed on a one that he initially tried to set. I hear there's some real big fish in here. Big old steelheads. Hard to catch, but... Real good eating. Hard to catch. Get your excuses in early. <laughs> by a complaining know-it-all? Come on, son. I'm sorry. No, you ain't. <laughs> it's all right. Come on, let's fish. When you are the parent of a very intelligent child, you are presented with a choice. Do you appreciate that for what it is? Do you cultivate it? Do you reinforce it? Do you play with it? Or do you frame it in a way or you're threatened by it. Many parents inadvertently go in the direction of threatened because they believe that their role is to always know better than their children. Parents who are threatened by the intelligence of their children will often put down their children. They will exert force in ways that is not really conducive to forming a meaningful relationship with them. John already has some part of his self-image that he's not a very smart man. Jack is going to heighten that sense for him. John needs to make sure that he doesn't make his insecurities Jack's problem. That little interaction with him there where he gets kind of mean, calls him a complaining know-it-all, it's more about John than it is about Jack. And if you're a parent, you gotta pay attention to what your kid is and how they are and what they're trying to accomplish. Too many parents take what their children say and do personally. Don't make it about you. Make it about them. You'll have a lot more meaningful relationship as a result.